launching a podcast can be painful. That's probably why only 1% who start make it past episode 21. We're in the top 1% now as we just crossed 52 episodes. Can I get a fist bump, Barton? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's do this. Pain. <laughs> Your sound effect was <laughs> <laughs> We have had people ask us, how do you launch a podcast? So to celebrate our one-year anniversary, we are going to share how we started and what we did to make it in the 1%. So you can, too. Our what inspired us to start this podcast? I think hopefully our stories uh, match up, but maybe they won't, and that's okay. But what 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 was the reason you wanted to get into podcasting? Oh, I mean, what I remember is you, as you were working on your career accelerator course, um, you wanted an accountability coach, and uh, it was like a couple of years ago. You're like, hold me accountable. I need to do this. I'm like, okay. So then, as we started talking every week, I'm like, my God this stuff is pretty good. We should put it on a podcast because uh, uh, that's the best way for us to network with others too because we're both kind of introverts, extroverts in some situations. Uh, that's kind of what inspired us to start it, not really knowing exactly where we're going to take it, but we knew that uh, it was something fun we wanted to do that we knew had potential if we actually did it right. That's kind of my recollection of uh, what, why we did it. Yeah, no, and, and I think with that, a couple of the things that you said that we just saw as big benefits for us to be able to do it is we knew that it would help us on the networking uh, front and we knew that we wanted to grow out, you know, um, a stronger network. Uh, like many, we we're one of those who at times always said to ourselves, uh, we should network more. Uh, and this became a natural way for us to do so because we were able to explore our, our curiosity at the same time because when there were things we wanted to learn about, um, it it gave us a platform to do so because otherwise some of the questions we ask people would just be weird or we never get the time of day if we just tried to connect with them on, you know, the street or email or something. Well, yeah, and you know what it is, you know, and, and one of the, I, even though it's cliche about networking, they said, well, add value, add value. Well, sometimes when you're like, no, we're like instantly what value you're going to add. It's kind of, it was always a tough thing. But with this, we're instantly adding value to a guest because uh, we're getting them some we're not we're not like a major podcast. We have we have some eyeballs, so we're just getting them some uh, value. So it kind of makes it easy for us to network because we're instantly giving value. It uh, kind of itches our own curiosity, and we made some really incredible friends. It, it's true, yeah. No, we've uh, really enjoyed it so far. I know you and I, and we'll talk about this later. You know, obviously, are always looking at oh, here's what we could do better. Here's what we could do. Differently, But I think that was a huge benefit back to what you said with the programs, both of ours in that matter, is we saw it as a way to be able to build authority in the space and our own personal brands, too, by being out there. And um, I know you shared some stories. I, I happen to live out in the middle of nowhere. I've still had some, but not as many as you, but where you will run into individuals and, you know, they look at you a little bit, you know, a celebrity like now just because um, we do have this podcast and, you know, each each week we show up with another episode and it's that's another huge benefit that I think we've seen from it too. I didn't know if you want to expand on that at all. Yeah, it's, it's been uh, it's been interesting because sometimes it, when you're starting something, it can feel like crickets. You're like, is anybody actually listening? Like, you don't get the 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 feedback or kind of the social media, YouTube likes and stuff. You're like, are we doing anything? And then randomly, you you bump into somebody. It's like, oh my god, I love your podcast. That episode was great. So it's like, ah, okay, it's, it is. People are actually checking this out so it's good uh so it is this weird thing in the beginning where you might think it's crickets but don't be surprised if uh people are actually being impacted positively by whatever message you're uh, putting out there well again i moved a thousand miles away from you know uh, la where i used to live with you so i don't have those run-ins as much with individuals but i randomly did have one where i ran into somebody and they're like oh i was just listening to your uh podcast you know out here where i live with basically population you know uh 800 uh, yeah. so it is it is it is incredible and just hearing them be able to talk about some specific things or i love that guest that you had um on i was talking to again somebody uh the other day about that and they had just listened to one of the episodes actually one with um uh dan uh tokini i don't butcher his last name. And they're just like, man, like that's exactly what I, you know, needed and the things that came from that. Anyway, that's an incredible feeling to have, even though at the same time, we still don't have loads of engagement in our comments and things like that. But 
you nor I are ones who often engage in comments either, nor are we often ones who even give likes sometimes or even subscribe right away to everything. And I think that's an important thing that we've had to remind ourselves of um, because sometimes it is like the tip of the iceberg. You might get a few interactions, but really you may still have loads of people beneath who are watching, consuming, enjoying, um, which, you know, is important to remind ourselves. Of. Yeah. And it's definitely, you know, as we go into year two, it's going to be a focus of ours. Like, how do we get more engagement? And it's stuff that we're studying and researching and drawing on uh, other experts to figure out how do we do this better. Um, going back to, you know, in the beginning of the story, I think the one thing that also helped us get started was not overthinking and not uh, trying to be a perfectionist about this. You know, Michael and I were like, let's just do it. Don't even worry about a title. So we started actually coming up with our first 10 episodes, what the episode's uh, message would be and then in the content without even knowing what the podcast was called. And then at, at while we're recording, um, Michael put five names down. I put five names down. Mine all sucked. I like one of Michael's. So we're like, let's do it. In the spirit of not overthinking, we're doing it. Then a few days later, uh, in parallel, we were kind of trying to uh, work. We had just started on LinkedIn. So Michael asked me a question on LinkedIn. I was kind of busy, but at the same time, I had just watched an episode of Mandalorian. So he asked me a question, and the, just I was busy. I just wrote back to him, this is the way. And then I thought to myself, that's the name. That should be the name of the podcast. This is the way. This is the way to do this. This is the way to do that. And obviously, a play on Mandalorian. So that's how we got the name. It was kind of random and spontaneous, uh, but it was all in the spirit of not overthinking that we come up with the name. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think uh, with it, we've, you know, had some fun uh, with, you know, how we play on that and things. I think one of the areas, though, is we still talk about it because you said we just got started, is our niche. And I think we have still kind of struggled a little bit to fully identify exactly what that is because again with with both of us and each of us you know with um uh, coaching and programs you know around um the career space and then also around helping people uh launch and grow their own um businesses it's it's the struggle we've had because for us personally we did work in you know our jobs where we covered both sides like we were entrepreneurial while we were in our jobs and we're focusing on people like that, but what we still don't know or have enough data around or been able to see is whether or not our listeners happen to lean more towards um, one versus the other. But what we've decided to do right now is that we are going to lean a lot more into um, having the focus be those core things that we still want to learn as we continue to expand our own entrepreneurial journeys. There will still be some stuff in the career um, uh, space as we feel that it's appropriate, but ultimately we're going to create a playlist of a lot of the career ones we have. We feel like we've talked to some really great people in that space and then also have some of our own perspective. Um, but we'll, we'll, we will hear more of us when it comes to the actual kind of side hustle and building the entrepreneurial, um, side of it. Now, again, for some people who are still in their jobs, that career advice could really help, uh, in the positioning them as they, you know, work on these other things, but we just don't want to spend as much time in that um, category. But if anybody says, are you kidding? I love that. We'd love to hear more about that, but that's where we go as we try to think about, um, how we could speak a little bit more, um, to our audience while we're still trying to fully, you know, form what that even looks like. And, and I have to say, I mean, it's, the, especially in the beginning where not only you're trying to figure out what are we going to talk about? How are we going to do this? There's a tech te technical aspect of it too. Um, good thing Michael and I are technical, especially given our film school backgrounds. But it still took some time to figure out well, what cameras are we going to use? What's the software are we going to use? Uh, how are we going to do this virtually? Like there were still a lot of things to figure out. So uh, to kind of tell you guys what we've done, we're using Riverside FM as our virtual studio. It's great because it records natively onto the hard drive and then it uploads it to the cloud. So if during the recording process, you have kind of, you're, you're throttling your uh, Wi-Fi, uh, it, it won't impact uh, quality because it's all being recorded locally. So that, that, that was a great tool we did. 
I can vouch for that because, uh, well, I did eventually increase my speeds here, but just where I was at, I had some issues sometimes where that would um, happen, but you would never know it because once more, the natively and then putting it up in the cloud afterwards uh, helps to solve for that. Uh, I'm using a Canon camera that's just connected uh, as a webcam. Uh, Canon has uh, something called EOS Webcam Utility. So if you go uh, on their uh, website, um, you can just download that utility. And that's how it allows for um, your Canon camera to be connected as a uh, webcam to, uh, to your laptop or your desktop. Michael uses Sony. How, how, what's your setup like, Michael? Yeah, mine's the uh, Sony ZV E10. And the idea is for me is I got this because I knew that the lenses I was going to get for it were also lenses I could then leverage. Uh, once I determined that I was um, able or should upgrade uh, to something else in the Sony um, family, uh, again, not looking to do that right away because this has worked for um, the needs. Uh, but that's ultimately what I did is just looked at something where I knew that any of the lenses I invested in, I could always do because I do use a wide angle uh, lens um, on this side as well from Sigma. When it came to mics, <laughs> um, nothing fancy about the mics, but the one challenge I ran into... Uh, it is a USB cable that connects to the laptop and allows the webcam to switch to the mic. It just wouldn't connect. Like I, I went for like a couple of weeks. Finally, I did some research. Turns out that not all USB, USB-C cables are meant to be for like data transfer. Some are for charging only. I was like, light bulbs, I had no idea. So finally, I did some research. It took me two minutes. Found one on Amazon that people were recommending. Bought it. Boom. Worked. But for two weeks, it drove me crazy. That Why isn't this cat microphone connecting? Uh, did you have trouble like that, Mike, in the beginning? I don't remember. No. Mine ended up working well, which is probably good because even though you give us both credit for being more technical, you're uh, more technical than uh, I am. But no, I didn't have that um uh, issue. The one thing I did run into early on is at first I thought about running it off of just the, the batteries and then eventually I did buy an adapter that allows it to run uh, from there, which is good. Otherwise, we'd probably be um, having too many times where uh, it died, you know, during a um, record. Yeah. Um, but the the other thing from the mic perspective, as you mentioned that, again, at some point in the future, I'd probably go with a different setup, but this was a, a pretty low cost setup. I think it gets the um, job done. When I do record stuff for my course videos, I do um, leverage, you know, actually I've got this little fella here, the Zoom in, um, H1N1, um, where you can do a lavalier in that way. But we didn't want to add that extra um, requirement to where we would then have to sync our audio separately from that. So I think this works really well for uh, what we're doing and getting good quality um, audio. The other thing that technically drove me crazy, and it took me a long time to figure out actually, but it was so silly once I figured it out. My video kept recording in 720p. I couldn't figure out why, because the camera, it could go up to 4K. Uh, but obviously, you don't need 4K. That's just too much uh, data. I couldn't figure it out. Finally, it turns out that the, the Canon EOS webcam application that you need to download and create an account for has a subscription service. You have to pay $5 a month, and once you pay $5 a month, it unlocks the 1080p option. I'm like, of course. Why didn't I think of that in the beginning? They're always trying to squeeze you out of some subscription one way or another. Now that you say that, by the way, what is mine even? Is, did that change mine when yours became, or is mine still? No, you're still 720p. So uh, you might have a similar. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't researched. But again, I think one of those things in this perfect example is that if we stopped until we had all that perfect, here we are 52 episodes later it doesn't matter like a lot of that doesn't matter in fact we recently had um uh an individual on the uh podcast and i'm like man what camera are you using it looks great he has his iphone so like you can use your iphone um and that's going to be fine i think again a, a separate mic is a good idea that you uh have that's just going to pick up better audio um quality even though the mic on your you know, iPhone, the latest ones, like they keep getting better and better. And soon they will um, far advance what we have here setup wise. But you can't, you know, and actually you do have some flexibility with the latest iPhones too when it comes to wide angle lenses and other things that you have. So they really can't get the job done. So if you're overthinking it, again, 
uh, just set it up. Know that most people don't even make it past three episodes. So challenge yourself to get past three episodes, and then you could always upgrade the equipment later. Just start with a good mic. Start with your um, iPhone if that's you know um, what you uh, have, and you can still get the job done. The other thing I will say that I think is good here is we both took some care in at least trying to make sure, okay, our backgrounds are set up in a way that look presentable because we didn't want it to just feel like we were on a Zoom call or something like that. So we have set that up. And then I do have um, a couple of lights here on the side that I did spend, you know, uh, 150 on one of them. And then the other one is just a basic $20 um, light. Um, so we did take a little bit care in our um, lighting so that that wasn't so that our level of professionalism uh, helped as well. Art, and what do you have going on in your in there lighting wise? Same thing. I have a uh, the hundred hundred fifty dollar floodlight from one angle, and on this side I have one of those ring cameras that people use for like uh, uh, camming or whatever. Uh, so I, I use that. You mean ring light, right? Not a ring camera, I assume. Yeah, the ring light. Yep. No, your, your setup, our setups are, are pretty much the same. And then again, you know, uh, in the background here, it's like, I got this little light that's going on somewhere back there. There it is. Um, and again, you see the blur that happens. That's the nice thing you get with this wide angle lens that makes it feel a little more professional, but you know, just try to add a little natural art and has it behind us or not natural, but, um, ambient, um, lighting, which can just also, um, help set the feel for the iPhone. Actually, if you're going to start with the iPhone, I think it's iPhone 14, start with iPhone 14 and the latest iOS. You can actually wirelessly convert the iPhone into a webcam. It's pretty amazing. That's awesome. Awesome. And then the one thing I would say with that too is if going there, uh, the, the Pro does have the better settings when it comes to your um, lens and the way you capture. In fact, what's nuts about some of these, these the iPhone now is you could actually manipulate the um, depth of field uh, afterwards as well. Not that you need to worry about doing all that, but just sort of saying you have a lot of options should you want them. So it's perfect. But I, I would say that probably a professional sounding audio will stand out better than trying to be professional looking because people are more used to hearing crisp professional sound. If the, uh, the video is a little bit like average looking, I think that's totally fine. But just make sure your audio is good because that's most of the content content in these podcasts it's it's audible it's you're not looking for visual cues as much so just make sure audio is in good shape yeah so what about um for the editing side of things did you want to talk about that a little bit yeah uh before i get there i i do want to say that the way we started too was we told ourselves to uh, obviously forget about the title but let's do 10 episodes before we publish anything let's have 10 episodes in the can one reason was to see, do we even like doing this? Like the idea of it sounded good, but are we going to even like it? Uh, and then are we going to be semi good at it? Or like, can we sl slowly get better and bring an episode? So we did 10 episodes uh, without guests, just Michael and I. And we're like, this is kind of cool. We like, we like it. We're learning a lot. We're chatting as regularly we would anyways. That's how we started. The editing of it, um, again, drawing on both of our film school experience, <laughs> we're like, let's edit ourselves. Well, a little time consuming. <laughs> um, we both have uh, busy with other stuff. This is not a main gig. This is a side hustle. Um, so we're like, hmm, are there tools out there? So we did some research and we were doing uh, Pro Me, uh, Adobe Premiere Pro. Uh, we did some research and turns out during the AI boom that we're in right now, uh, there was an AI tool that had just released for Adobe Premiere Pro. Uh, do you remember what it was called, Michael? Audio, auto, Autopod. Autopod, Autopod. So it's this AI-based multicam uh, editor. <laughs> Pretty incredible. You basically um, install it as a plugin to, uh, for Premiere Pro. Then you, uh, when you set it up, you say, oh, uh, track one is Michael, track two is R10. Track three is two of us side by side. Press go. In one minute, it basically does a, an edit for you. Then you have to go in there and make tweaks of it. We found out that while it was good and a huge time saver, it still required time to do this. Uh, when we knew that we can probably get a, an, an editor you know, out of the country somewhere editing for us, 
we're like, it's probably best to get a fresh eye doing this anyways. So we have an editor uh, offshore that does uh, edits for us for $50 an episode. <laughs> uh, it's a huge time saver for us. Uh, and he puts a professional, more professional uh, spin on it than we do. So that's kind of what we do with our editing now. It's uh, we outsource it. And and I think with that again, Autopod a pretty incredible tool of what it um, can uh, do. So I don't think once more if somebody had a little more time than they did money, then that's a great way uh, to to go. Um, because Art and I've also been you know working on building other businesses and and have. Uh, other focuses for us is that was just the, um, the the best approach, you know, for for us. Now that said, we also do create a fair amount of um, uh, shorts, and in that scenario, uh, we did start off doing some of those on our own. I still I still work a little bit on them. I admit I uh, leverage um, I uh, intern come in and, and work on some of those as well as actually my uh, son uh, who's uh, twelve also works on. Uh, some of those things, his hourly rate is fair. Um, and with that, you know, there are a couple of tools that we also use. Submagic is really great to get those really nice kind of fancy subs that pop up. So if you look at some of our shorts, those are generated more or less automatically through Submagic. You still have to go through and edit those and you have a chance to add some other stuff. We'll add some B-roll there. Other B-roll we'll actually add when we um, uh, edit. But we've been experimenting a lot with the shorts, trying to understand how much they actually help our um, reach and it's still hard to exactly say, but we do get a fair number of subscribers that come in um, through those uh, outside of Sub Magic and again still using in our case Premiere. Although the um, uh, Emily, who we work with, uses uh, DaVinci. Um, in those cases, um, uh, we also leveraged another tool called Cast Magic for a period of time. Although Riverside has some of it now, and it's basically an AI tool that lets you upload an audio file typically um, of the whole podcast. And then it will go ahead and like break down information like synopsis. Um, it could even comes up with ideas for social media posts that we haven't used a whole lot um, ourselves, newsletters, but it basically does the whole transcript. And then it um, summarizes like, this is where we think some of the chapters should be. This is a synopsis and those stuff. So that was a nice tool too, that we had leveraged for a period of time, but now Art is pulling a lot of that out of Riverside itself. Is that right, Art? Yeah, I mean, Riverside slowly is adding more AI functionality in there, which is, which is great. Yeah, it's never perfect, uh, but it's a better starting point than starting from scratch for all of these. So it just speeds up the process, which I think what in general AI is going to do, it's not going to really replace the humans. It's just going to speed up what the humans were doing before. What we did use at 1.2, there was another tool, I can't even remember its name, that was helping us to reformat all the shorts because that part can be a little bit annoying when we are getting them into the um, vertical versus a horizontal. It's called VDO, V-E-E-D dot I-O, VDO. That was the original one you were using? That's right. That was the original tool we used to okay. take 16 by 9 shots and uh, convert them into vertical 9 by 16 for YouTube shorts and Instagram reels and TikTok. But then we struggled to adjust in there sometimes, like when, when it turned out that there was two people on screen because of our initial cut, it just became a bit of a, a challenge. So we end up doing a lot of that now through these other um, uh, editing tools um, instead. Um, I, I've i done a few tests with a couple of um, other softwares that are out there. Um, uh, one of those was Opus Clips. Um, and then there's another one I'm playing with. Uh, right now as well that's called I think content labs if I'm not mistaken and they haven't been that strong like you might get a few out of them but for whatever reason so far even though we've heard some people say oh yeah they're great you could just repurpose and get loads of shorts out of it but again the quality of them has been a little hit and myth for us I think the nuance with the podcast sometimes is those AI tools I think are using keywords and things like that to kind of pick a clip but it's still not really good at actually identifying like um how you're going to set the clip up to the audience, you know, what the intro looks like uh, to that and really making sure that there's enough context in there. So sometimes we've used it a little bit as like a, an initial pass or if it's like, okay, we are only going to get some clips out of this video, then might look at it like I just did a test on that recently. I'm like, okay, four or five came out of this. But if we go through on our own, we can get 10 to 15 different shorts out of a video if we want to put that time uh, into it. So I'm still on the fence about those tools, but I do think that, you know, there is some, uh, promise there. And eventually what we're thinking about doing too is maybe we'll use some of those tools that also help us to generate um, 
you know, when we think about newsletters, when we think about um, uh, specific stuff around SEO and other content, they could probably help make our workflow better, but we're still in the early days of playing with us. Yeah. The other, the other aspect of <clears throat> podcasting that obviously we're a year into it. So it's not that we're early in the days, but I think we haven't dedicated as much time to it as we should, but that's going to be a focus of ours going to year two is the title and the thumbnail. <laughs> uh, we've kind of uh, gone about the title and thumbnail a little more instinctively and based on what else we're seeing. But just now we're starting to get into experts and how they do it. And, and all of a sudden we're like, oh, wow, okay, I see it now. <laughs> So the plan definitely is to take some um, expert advice, maybe you know, hire some experts, or you know, take some online courses around this topic to improve our thumbnails and titles and how the text or icons on the thumbnail tell the same story as the title. So, so it, it's huge, especially if you're going to be a YouTube first podcast, which is what we are. We are on uh, Apple and Spotify and everywhere else. Uh, but we are YouTube first and thumbnail and title is key. You could have the most amazing episode with the most amazing guest, but if your thumbnail and title are bad, you're never going to get there. <laughs> and I, and I heard somewhere that a good click through rate is above 8%. So if, if you can get more than 8% of people that see your thumbnail and title click through it, you've done the job. Uh, I did. And something that we actually haven't done a good job either is analyzing the data of all this. Mike and I did a couple of quarterly offsite sessions virtually <laughs> where we dove into the data, but I think we can do better at it. Uh, so I looked and a couple of videos I looked at uh, are kind of YouTube search, whoever that was searching for a topic and saw our a podcast, the click through rate was 7%. So those two episodes were actually pretty close to being above what the experts say. Uh, but I, I would highly say that, that, that those are two things you got to learn how to nail down to be successful. Yeah. And I, I think so, you know, we've tried to re refine this while also admitting that sometimes, you know, it's like, we're like, okay, good enough, which again, I would still say lean towards good enough, but then know that you'll continue to refine these things because now when you're in the weeds, you get a workflow going, you can start optimizing that workflow. Um, uh, a, a little bit more. And I think that's a big piece of it too. It's like what's allowed us to remain consistent with this is, you know, generally speaking, like each week, what we have is we usually have, you know, one call um, on average a week. Some weeks like this week, we're actually going to, I think, be squeezing in about four, but then that's because the last two weeks we happen to not have um, any, if I recall correctly, or one technical error in there too. But it's like, so we'll figure out um, exactly. You know, we'll schedule these. We reach out to, um, guess we'll, we'll go back to the guest part in a minute, but basically scheduling the call. We have a place that we track this in a Google doc. We're trying not to overthink this stuff. What also really helps us is having the co-host here. Um, it's, you know, a bit like a, uh, you know, committing to the gym with a gym buddy. Uh, you know, you're going to show up cause you don't want to let them, uh, down. And that really helps in the early days sometimes of keeping going. If you think anything is going to stand in your um, uh, way. So we're each other's, uh, podcast, um, buddies. We've also been able to divide and conquer, um, which has helped to lessen the load. Again, when we talk about some of the different aspects here that we tackled, well, each of us seems to lean, you know, towards specific, um, areas or, or categories and we divide and conquer on some of them. Um, but for, uh, uh, sorry, we, we will sometimes do similar tests. Like let's just say when we're working through our outlines, <clears throat> one of us will take an outline the other one that comes in with their feedback on the outline. And it's usually extremely valuable because when you're in, you know, the zone of trying to research these guests, figure these stuff out, the first draft usually isn't as strong as where we get when we then beat it up together and try to take the learnings that we've had around, you know, stronger intros and hooks because those tie so importantly back to what Artin said about that thumbnail. If you think about the thumbnail, I like to think about it in movie terms. You know, the thumbnail is almost like the movie trailer. Uh, to get people to actually watch the the movie itself. In this case, it's the thumbnails to get people to watch our um, episode. And you want to make sure in those first few seconds when people click through that 
there's that promise that you made in the thumbnail and the title match. Otherwise people might be like, oh, this isn't what I was uh, looking for. Um, and then, you know, I think the other thing is as we have refined the process, again, we have hired out a few um, different things on this, but we also have what's now kind of a second nature approach to creating the podcast here because, you know, we are at least far enough advanced. So we know we always have that, but, you know, Art and Will uh, raise that flag sometimes too. And it's like, you know, or either one of us can, but he usually raises a flag that's like, oh, we're, we're getting down to four episodes now in the can. We got to make sure we get, because we like to keep a certain number of episodes in the can um, as well. But I think our hammered out process there, but really for us doing it together has been very helpful with that because there has been a level of accountability um, to it. And, and the outline that Michael talks about is basically our hook, an introduction, and then a loose set of questions that we think we're going to go through with our guest to get the value out of that episode that aligns with the topic of the episode. It kind of helps us stay focused and not be all over the place. <laughs> um, now, in transparency, our hooks are, has been hit and miss. Some are really good. Some were like, all right, I wish we went back, we should have done it differently. <laughs> That is a direct correlation to retention. Um, so when we look at our videos, because you know YouTube will tell you exactly where people are dropping off. Uh, sometimes they're dropping off early. Sometimes they're dropping off pretty far into it. And what we've learned is that if you start an intro or a hook with a lot of rambling and nothing that tells the the person watching or listening who this content is for and what they're going to get out of it, people bounce out. Like you have five seconds, three seconds to kind of tell people who is this for, what are they going to get out of it? Like what's the transformation they're going to get out of this? And if that video is for them, they're in. If not, they're out. But if you ramble and kind of go all over the place, more people fall out. And we've seen this and, and we'll put up some screenshots as an example, so you can you can see how people have been bouncing out of our videos when we kind of started drifting away from our the core topic. It, and you know, I think uh, there's a lesson there <laughs> for all of us in life, but it's funny how we don't see it. Meaning that that's how it is, no matter what. When we're talking to somebody or whatever it is, it's like usually you know it's like you have this moment to grab their attention, um, otherwise you lose them. And I think um, as obvious as that is, and the reason I want to point that out is because it still has been this thing that we know it like instinctually, you know, it. you're like, duh, and this is how you do it. But you still sometimes in the nature of, you know, writing the outline or just getting excited about saying something that might mean something to you, you're, you need to craft this and make sure it's to your, um, your, your audience. I remember one of our guests, um, he's, uh, successful, um, business where he, um, helps people both on the branding side as well as on LinkedIn. And, he always starts like whenever he does a post, he starts it off with dear son. Um, and then he ends his with love dad. Now, while that may not be exactly what we're you know approaching here, the idea is when you do that and when you're thinking about things in those terms, it does get you to address somebody specifically out of um, the gate. And this is also why when we talked about our niche before that becomes important for us, when you're trying to speak to everybody, that becomes this big challenge. And that's why we're trying to narrow it in and make sure like to Artin's point here, you know, and even when we started this episode, it's like, how do you own an in for people who want to start, um, you know, a, a podcast? Because now it's clear, oh, that's me versus trying to speak to everybody, which I think we did for a lot of our um, episodes and may still periodically, we don't know who we're trying to, but the idea here is to really refine it to make sure it's more clear of who we want to speak to. We're constantly learning and learning and growing. I mean, the, the other part of this is SEO on YouTube which is something where we're struggling. We've learned a little bit, but I don't think we're anywhere uh, as good as we should be. That's something we're going to be focusing on. There's tools out there. Uh, there's a tool called uh, TubeBuddy that kind of helps you with keywords and, and SEO. Um, we haven't actually analyzed the data yet to see if, that, if uh, there was a change. Because the one good thing about YouTube, um, because of all the data it provides, you could publish a, uh, a, a video, look at the data, then a week later, update the title and see if there's any change. And then update the thumbnail and see if there's any change. Change, this, change the keywords and, and um, SEO on it, see if there's a change. 
So you can constantly refine it. Now, all this takes time. And kind of that's another challenge here that you have to make time to do some of this analysis. Otherwise, you'll just be drifting. So for year two, Mike and I are committing to uh, a little more uh, analysis of our analytics to make data-driven decisions and not be as instinctual. I mean, let our instincts drive it, but data to support it. Because I feel like we've been around the block uh, for a while, given our careers and uh, entrepreneur ventures and just doing this. Uh, we we kind of have some instincts already built in, but we want data to support it. Arden, did you want to touch a little bit too on um, guests and how we've tra tracked down and pulled our guests in? At first, <laughs> um, you were like, well, how do we guess? How do we get guests? So we started looking at um, other podcasts. We're like, wow, how are these podcasts pulling in this massive guest? <laughs> uh, one, we never had interviewing experience before outside of job interviews. So we we're like, how do we do this? So by the way, that was another huge benefit of this podcast for us. We didn't mention. And for anybody who's thinking about doing it is it improves those interviewing skills and it gets you more comfortable on camera, um, which I think just is super valuable because obviously the better you can get at that communication and the better you can get with engaging with people. Um, I, there's a correlation to success in general in life. So, yeah. So in the beginning, <laughs> What we did was we just looked at our own network. We said, who is somebody that was not going to say no to us? That would actually make sense. So we kind of went down the list, whether it was our phones or LinkedIn. So I would say probably the first seven, eight guests were drawn from our network of uh, friends and, and colleagues, people that were successful in their uh, own right, whether from their career or entrepreneur side. As we got comfortable with guests, we're like, okay, how do we now go beyond this? So we started doing research on how do you do this. Uh, a lot of a lot of the typical advice is we'll just reach out to people on LinkedIn and other platforms. So we did that. We got some yeses, some uh, ghost <laughs> responses, and some, some, I'm sorry, I don't have time for this. Uh, then we found some platforms too. There's a platform called matchmaker.fm. That basically allows you to uh, post your podcast up and guests that want to be business owners, speakers, coaches, authors that want that publicity will actually reach out to you and say, hey, this is um, they, they pitch to us. So we now get a lot of pitches from people through these platforms and through just LinkedIn that want to be uh, uh, guests. So the table has turned. We're not like... <laughs> desperately seeking out for guests, people are coming to us. There's another platform called Guestio, just guests.io, a uh, similar concept where the, there's people that, that want to be guests uh, and there's podcasts that need guests. So it's kind of, you know, connects the dots with people. Uh, we've had some success through there, but I would say that probably most of our success has been through our own network and through LinkedIn is where we got most of our guests. And the interesting that thing that happens is as the caliber of a guest increases, it makes it easier for the next guest to be even bigger. So you got to start small, just like in anything, uh, and then slowly build up your guest. So, you know, our recent um, guest that we had, uh, we had um, uh, Jasmine, you know, Alich, uh, big influencer on LinkedIn, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers. We would have never gotten him 10 months ago just because our, our reach was small. Uh, we also had editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. We would have never gotten him eight, nine months ago, but the fact that we have gotten these other pretty notable uh, public figures, it was easier to get them. So just build your guest profile higher and higher. Uh, don't shoot for the stars right away. Start small and just go up and up and, and use these platforms too. Yeah, and I think that's great too because, again, along the way, um, our friends uh, in our network early on were more, you know, call it forgiving, you know, as we were working through some of these things, but it helped us to really get um, better. Now, maybe there's those stories you hear out there about somebody who started right off the gate with somebody big, and maybe that's who's in the network. Hey, whoever you have, you know, leverage and use it, but for us, this was the approach that we ended up um, uh, taking. So, um, Arden, um, 
challenges wise, just making sure we touched on a few of um, those. I think one of the key things, you know, that you mentioned, some of the technical things that come up, the 720 versus 1080p, the things like our title thumbnails description, you know, SEO and trying to work through that, even shorts creation that we mentioned can be a bit time consuming. Um, retention was another one of those things and how we've been playing with different intros. But another thing is, is we really did want to have faster growth than what we've had. Now, we're not far off from 2000 um, subs in a, a year, which is which is not bad. Um, it's just, you know, you do hear and see these stories out there with people. And this is that's YouTube we're speaking to. There's obviously some other downloads and subs through um, Apple and Spotify. But but because that's one where we spend a lot of our time more video first. Um, but that has been something that we wanted to happen faster. And the reality is that we've realized here with um, podcasts, especially sometimes they can be slow moving. We follow and so does so many other people in the world. So many may know Alex Ramosi, who's founder of acquisition.com. Um, he had mentioned that he had his podcast going, gosh, I can't remember if it was two years, four years, something in between there. And it was only once he <laughs> say became somebody like once he sold his business, you know, and now could say he was worth over a hundred million that really people started tuning in like crazy. And then they started going back to his previous episodes as as well. But I think the nature of a podcast is it's, I believe it's harder to go viral with a podcast because you're not creating it necessarily for virality. Maybe something will happen in it that gives you some, you know, um, virality. Unless you bring Elon Musk as a guest. Right, that's it. Exactly. Yeah, which, you know, uh, maybe one day, one day uh, on, on Mars. Um, so, but I think that, that's something that people need to set their expectations for. And it's why it's so important to look at the other ways you're getting value um, that we've mentioned, you know, and sprinkled throughout this, because the growth of your network, you know, the, um, the way it builds up your own authority, the way that you now have this ability to, to open doors and meet people you might not have had um, before. It's like people before wouldn't have even probably responded to the message, but now at least when we can link them and they can see the podcast or they can see our um, one sheet, that you know captures their eye that really is 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 helpful and then also what we said with the interviewing and just general communication skills and just getting better at this game of you know the way that you approach um content creation like these are all huge huge benefits that we have but the reality is don't be shocked the podcast starts off slower that's where you want to remain consistent and know that you know uh it will continue to grow and then over time it starts to grow um faster and then as you know, there's more and more stories that come out of it that um, do have some of the virality or more of the guests. Some of that will happen. But again, just wanting to highlight that, you know, it is rare for people to have that sudden shot up with a podcast. Um, so it's you got to focus on those other benefits to keep yourself going. Otherwise, you'll drive yourself crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, mean, I think we touched on a lot. Uh, Michael, what would you say... Uh or focus for us uh, the next year. We want to get better YouTube in general. We're even playing with the idea of taking some of our longer podcasts and we might actually take out five, 10 minute sections um, is something that we've discussed playing with to see whether or not like that might attract um, uh, more people who are then exposed to our, our podcast versus maybe those who aren't into the hour long um, situations. We always tell ourselves we're going to try to do some that are a little bit uh, shorter. But honestly, that's a bit of a guess for us, too, because, look, there's podcasts out there that are two hours long that people will watch and listen to. I think as long as the value there is, the value is is there. And I think we're getting better and better at extracting um, more of that by asking really good uh, questions. In fact, that's a piece of the um, that's also important is when people are researching and their guests, like if you have the guests on for, you know, an hour long podcast, I believe you should be looking at putting in at least that much, if not more into researching the guests. I would argue and say even more than that. Uh, into the guests, especially um, earlier on in your days, because the better you research them, the more questions you can ask. I love asking questions of our guests when they're like, well, you dug deep for that one. And it's like, uh, because did some research and found that out. And I, I think that can be valuable because then you go into that with the sort of sense of already knowing them in many ways and being able to dive into the things that uh, pique your own uh, curiosity. One thing I want to mention about the questions, <laughs> what we try to do at least is Get to non-obvious answers, stuff that people can't just Google and can't use ChatGPT for. Sometimes it's tough because you never know where how the conversation is going to go. But that's a focus of ours. We we want to get those non-obvious answers uh, 
So it's not all fluffy, high level surface answers. You we want to go deep. Uh, and I think we've done that really well on some episodes and not on others, uh, but that's kind of how we reflect and keep improving. Yeah, it's a great point um, because sometimes you have an outline and it's easy to think to yourself, okay, I got to get through the outline. When the outline is just the outline and we call it that because you may need to throw it away because you might just start going deep into question number three or four. And if you feel like you have to cover everything, then um, sometimes it loses uh uh, that, you know, those unobvious, as Artin said, and really diving deep. And so you got to allow it and be flexible um, to go down that pathway. I think the, the, the other things just, you know, we'll continue to, uh, you know, up the caliber of our, of our guests and therefore also our, our, our network benefits. But we would like to move more towards monetizing of our um, podcast too. This is both, you know, directly through the ways that we can do that on a place such as YouTube, but also indirectly um, by, you know, still leveraging it as Art and I both look at programs and coaching and things that we um, have uh, upcoming or currently. And because ultimately that was one of the reasons we did start it. And um, it allows us to then help people through some of the areas that we know will unlock their abilities to be able to go further down the pathways of uh, entrepreneurship or excelling in their careers. Yeah. And, and, and something funny has happened, you know, when we talk about coaching, um, when we started, it was very much around our personal experiences, how we kind of were promoted and climbed the ladder at, at Disney and Netflix and then kind of entrepreneur venture. So our focus is going to be focused on that. Then people have started coming out to us and say, well, how do you launch a podcast? Can you help us with launching a podcast? So we could definitely help out, uh, help you launch your podcast. So if you need help launching your podcast, hit us up. Uh, obviously, we know what we're doing now. Um, and I think aside from that, actually, and on that note, Artin, what would you say as far as advice we give to anybody who is just starting out with their podcast? What key things um, do they need to narrow down so that they're not overthinking every single piece of it? What would be the three things that they need uh, to be successful? They have to be, you have to be consistent. Uh, just uh, block out your calendar uh, for, you know, an hour of recording an episode and an hour of research and, or working on it. So just block that out months in advance. So that, that way there is no conflict. And then just be consistent at it. Just keep doing that. Keep doing it. Uh, as you get into it, you're naturally going to start asking questions because you ex you encounter stuff that you need answers to. Uh, and by staying consistent is how you get those answers faster. Because if you, you're not consistent, then you're not going to get to the answers faster. And I think that's what really has helped us. We have now published, uh, well, as of recording this episode, 52 episodes every week uh, for, for a year now. Uh, that has helped us get to the level that we are now, that we know exactly a lot. Now, we're not experts on how to scale your podcast to a million dollar podcast. That's on us yet. Hopefully it is one day, but we definitely know how to launch and get to a year and get to some eyeballs and, and some uh, audience uh, growth. So we were good at that. But the only way we did it was because we were consistent and had an accountability partner. So I would say get make sure you have a co-host. Doing it solo is very difficult unless you already are a public figure that people trust you. Otherwise, it's very difficult to do it solo. Uh, and then if you really want to keep it easy, you can start audio only. That reduces your technical needs and video preparers. You could start audio only. But in these days, my personal opinion is you got to be video first. Um, I, th I think that that will help your uh, growth faster. Yeah. In fact, I'm trying to remember there's somebody recently who they had mentioned that that's what they wish they would they wish they would have started with um, the video first. Um, so no, I think that's that's great. And again, don't overthink the, the tech, folks. Just you know, pick something, use it, um, and you know you can adapt and move on from there. We'll link to all of the tools and uh, cameras or you know any type of equipment. We'll link them all uh, in case you want to set up our exactly what we said. And if you have any questions that we didn't answer, please uh, add those below and we'll be sure to respond to um, all of those. Um, otherwise, if you enjoyed this episode, we also think you'll enjoy the episode that we did with Travis Chappell. 
He's the founder of Guestio, which we mentioned, um, and he knows a thing or two about growing podcasts because he's near 1,000 episodes uh, at this point of his uh, podcast, Travis Makes Friends. So check that out. Um, otherwise, uh, thanks for being with us for uh, either this episode, if it's your first, or hopefully you've been with us from the beginning uh, and you've been able to um, watch for the last year. And we really appreciate everybody's support. Look forward to what the next year will bring. See you in the next one.